it's really terrific how many people have come out. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk or after the talk, I'll be happy to answer them and don't, don't hesitate to ask. So why is a show on the Holocaust on exhibition in a small Canadian town in 2016? Well, for starters, world history seeps everywhere. Syrian refugees, Vietnamese refugees are just as likely to show up in war court as anywhere else. The Syrian refugee dispersal has been described as the largest movement of refugees since World War II. My family and I were part of that flow of post-war refugees. Then other people might say, but the Holocaust is such a dark period in history. Why bother? It's true that it's dark, but this is also a story of the need to survive and the price of survival. So in the end, large moments in history provide a teachable event, which if we're lucky can enrich us, because life, after all, is everywhere. My parents weren't classic Holocaust survivors. They were not in concentration camps. They did not have numbers tattooed on their arms. But in a way, their history was harder to comprehend because their survival was the product, really, of geopolitical fate. Stalin and Hitler made a deal that divided Poland into spheres of influence. Those in the Russian sector, went to Siberia, and those in the German sector ended up in the concentration camps. One group lived, and the others didn't. My father was in the Polish army and was captured in the Russian sector and therefore ended up in Siberia. His family, including his wife, his child, his siblings, his parents, all ended up in the German sector and paid the price. The same was true for my mother's first husband. He and my mother were in the Russian sector, but her family and his family were in the German sector and all died in the concentration camps. So while my parents' arms were not tattooed with numbers, their brains were tattooed with loss. The show is equal measures about death, memory, and refuge. And the perspective is that of life that follows after the dust has settled and the war has quieted and people try to make their lives out of the rubble that remains. The show is small and the book is brief because I intended to have the story have the bones of poetry rather than flesh of prose. I tried to make it the equivalent, I suspect, of cave drawing. The effort was to simplify and capture a moment that would resonate with having, well, without having a weight to it that would numb. I grew up in the epicenter of Holocaust survivors in North America, which was in Montreal. As a child, I thought the Holocaust was an explosion, an event that arrived like a ball of fire, suddenly from nowhere instead of something that built slowly over time. So I grew up with the sudden prospect of immediate and unexpected destruction around every corner. The philosopher Theodore Adorno said that after Auschwitz, one could not write poetry, meaning, I think, that the events were too recent and too grave to be adequately represented in any art form. Perhaps you need the distance of time to create the Odyssey or the Iliad. So this show is the non-epic, the anti-epic. My parents were betrothed to their dead spouses and their dead lives throughout my childhood and throughout their lives. My mother's shadow world was her secret a never-ending reverence for her first husband. And her secret was her belief that my father was not her real child, real husband. Her real husband was dead, as was her real child. 
My father was less unequivocal, but it was clear that his life mate was also gone, and her surrogate was my mother. For my mother, her first husband, Adolf, was the standard bearer for matrimony. I heard about him almost every week of my life while I was living with my parents, and he was always presented as larger than life, and larger than any life my father could conjure. And appropriately for someone larger than life, he died heroically and tragically when the war ended and my mother and he returned to Warsaw to look for the remnants of their family and then he was stabbed to death by gangs looking for Jews with money. As a child in that kind of family, I had to tread a delicate balance between each of my parents' histories. I was their only surviving child, but I was more than that. I was an icon. I was a vessel for all of their blood connections. My parents didn't so much see me as a child, but as an ambassador for childhood. They understood and I understood that we all came from a different place in the world and in history. And they understood and I understood that I was expected to manage on my own. My father fluctuated between lucidity and states of high panic that came out as rage. And the paradox was that he was more stable immediately after the war, when he was still rebuilding his life, than when he became settled in Canada and his state of mind became less so. For him, the present was only something to endure because it was fraught with menace. To keep that menace at bay, for my father, there was only one thing and one thing only. To maintain life now in an acute form of order. So if a ketchup bottle was in the wrong place, if my shirt was out of my pants, these modest transgressions became triggers for explosion. If I wore socks in the house, of course that was the worst, because for Jews to wear socks indoors means that you're grieving for the dead. And my father wanted no talismans of grief, because the house was filled with guests, and those guests were the ghosts of my parents' lives. In the show, there is a medical report of my father that was prepared for him in order to assist his application for German reparations. The German government provided compensation to Holocaust survivors if they could prove that their lives were damaged by events that occurred at the hands of the Nazis. Of course, it's hard to imagine that anyone's life was enhanced at the hands of the Nazis, but there you are, that was the requirement. Both my parents came from Warsaw. Their ambition and hopes and futures were left behind in Warsaw. Once a year, my parents and their compatriots would meet at what was called the Warsaw Verbund Ghetto Memorial. This was a ghetto, this was a memorial for all the Jews who were from Warsaw, whose families had perished in Warsaw. So each year, we would go into a room of about 100 people who were crying and sighing and groaning. In the background, dirge-like, a woman dressed in black would play the piano. And then, when everyone was seated, we would begin reciting Yiddish poems, Yiddish songs. The most prominent of them was a song that the Jewish partisan sang in the Warsaw Ghetto at and before the time that they were resisting the Nazis, which in Yiddish said, Zokish Kemo is the guest in Lesenbeck, which means in English, never say you're going down the last path, which in effect means it's not over until it's over. And I went to these memorials every year from the age of seven until about the age of 18. My father was
was a non-denominational Holocaust believer. He wanted me to be aware of all Holocausts, not just the Jewish Holocaust. So I had to, be, had to learn about and understand the Armenian Holocaust. And he insisted that I read the text of that Holocaust, 40 Days of Musadah, because that talisman, that connection to destruction was almost insatiable for my father as a means of touching his own history. Yiddish is used in the show, and while the alphabet resembles Hebrew and the sound resembles German, it really is an amalgamation of its own. Like Creole, it's a patois. After the war, Jews in Israel frowned on the use of Yiddish because that was the European language of Jews, and they saw that as the language of the oppressed, reserved for those too weak to defend themselves. I remember meeting a famous Yiddish comedian in Tel Aviv. He was one half of the Yiddish equivalent of Wayne and Schuster. And he told me that he couldn't make a living in Israel because his humor was all in Yiddish, and Yiddish was kept to the shadows in Israel for that period when Israel was building itself in the 50s and 60s. My father loved Yiddish, Yiddish stories, Yiddish poems. He and his friends even published Yiddish books. One of them is in the show. I can still remember the names of Yiddish poets that would be discussed in my parents' home we had a well-known Yiddish poet who lived down the street, and once a year at Passover, he would come, and between dinner and the hockey game, he would read his poetry. Montreal was the capital city of Yiddish in Canada. My father was always seen with a folded Yiddish newspaper sticking prominently out of his pocket wherever he went. As one of the paintings in the show has that newspaper in his pocket as he sits on what looks like his Yiddish sounds like this. Der Zitter und den noch wieder. Wo bist du gegangen? Wo bist du gefahren? Wo sind deine Augen geworden, zu schwach zu picken? Wo ist die Welt geworden, verdeckt mit Feier? Wo bist du verbrennt geworden, von dem Licht von der goldenen Stern? And that means, I tremble and long for you. Where did you go? Where did you fall? Where did your eyes become too weak to see? Where did the world get covered in fire? Where were you burned by the light of a golden star? The lives my parents lived in Siberia made them preoccupied with bodily survival. Body parts, body functions, false teeth, constipation, exercise, these were their focus. All of the instruments of preoccupation with remaining alive. I, in turn, became preoccupied with my own bodily concerns and developed hypochondria when I was 15, given all the discussion of life and death that was chronic. Thereafter, I spent many years in medical libraries, in hospitals, looking for substance to the symptoms I thought I had. My mother, who took me for EKGs, would say to me, do you know how to make a punch? And she didn't mean Kool-Aid. She meant, did I know how to make a fist? She insisted that I learn how to box, how to defend myself. So I did. I spent many years learning self-defense, karate, boxing, law school. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called Preoccupied with My Father. And when I've given these talks, people sometimes ask me and say, what about your mother? The truth is, I was preoccupied with my father because my mother was a tougher meal to digest. <laughs> she was fearless. Her, her fearlessness was evident on many occasions, but clearest when she got behind the wheel of her car. <laughs> my parents were not car people. They were not people of the bus, the taxi, or the subway. They were foot people, because the foot was the choice of ambulation for refugees all over the world. And in their hearts, their heads, and anywhere else their selves lurked, my parents were above all refugees. They were always in or about to be in a state of flight. Both 
my parents wore glasses and my father was deaf in one ear, a vestige of his Siberian experience. He was about 60 years old when he learned how to drive, and his hearing loss, unfortunately, was on the right side of his head, which would have placed him behind the wheel at the point furthest from hearing the driving instructions that were being given to him. <laughs> the car they got was a Dodge Dart with a Slam 6 engine. And my father could only drive it once. The first time he got into the driver's seat, he rounded a corner and got so distressed at controlling the steering wheel that he stopped making a revolution and couldn't understand that you actually have to stop the wheel from turning at some point, and ended up on the front lawn of somebody's home. He got out of the car, walked away, and never drove again. <laughs> the car was retrieved by my mother, and then it became her baby. She never drove in winter, but what she did in summer was enough to make up for all the <laughs> My mother considered driving and signaling mutually exclusive activities. <laughs> and when she drove, whether on a city street or a highway, she had one rule and one rule only. You look straight ahead. You don't glance at any side view mirror or rear view mirrors. There's nowhere else to focus but in front of you. Donald Trump Jr. recently made a remark where he compared Syrian refugees to Skittles, arguing in a Twitter comment that you could not tell the good ones from the bad ones. That wasn't the first time that example was used or that concern was expressed. In 1941, Einstein begged Eleanor Roosevelt to allow Jewish refugees into the United States from Europe. But the Americans refused to permit that to occur because they mistrusted Jews who were then being killed in their millions by Germans as potential spies for the German regime. That attitude continued until 1944. Both my parents made extensive wartime travel. My father was taken from Poland to Siberia as a prisoner of the Russians. And my mother had followed her then husband to Kazakhstan and then Siberia, where her husband was a prisoner. She made the trip to Siberia from Poland by getting on a train without a ticket and her baby in her arms. When I say she got on the train, I don't mean she got into the car. She sat on the steps outside one of the cars and remained there until the conductor, taking pity on her, invited her in where it was warmer. The baby died in Kazakhstan. Fever. It was buried there. When she was in Siberia, my mother worked as a teamster driving a horse drawn wagon to deliver barrels of oil from one destination to another. The universe of the Holocaust that my parents inhabited wasn't restricted to our home, it really was the universe that they knew in Montreal. Dinner guests would reminisce about being hidden under floorboards from Nazis or reminisce about the dead. It was a complete world within a world. It was a world of apparent normalcy, but with all its own private rituals of memory. My father died in 2002, and my mother in 2005. In one of the photographs that's in the show, you can see the displaced persons camp in the background where I was born in 1947. Some of the camp documents are also in the show birth certificate, my parents' marriage certificate. Other documents that were issued to us principally included the Rise Passe, that was the travel pass. My parents and I, many Syrian refugees, were stateless between 1945 until 1952. We were permitted to travel only by the good grace of the United Nations issuing Rise Passes to us as they did to many others. So we traveled from Germany to Holland, where we lived for about five years, and from Holland to Canada. We were, throughout that experience, people without a country, people without any citizenship rights, people without any voice. We only became citizens years after we arrived in Canada, but our ability to travel and to be recognized was really a product of the documentation that the United Nations gave us. And that was true, in my case, for at least eight or nine years. While my father was not robust 
as robust in his attack on the world as my mother is. He had his own secret weapon for his survival, and that was knowledge. He insisted that one could never stop learning. Even on his deathbed, he repeated the mantra to me, never stop learning. Lectures, obscure little articles, books, those were his preoccupations throughout his life. But his obsession with learning really spoke to a greater need, which was his need to understand. He tried to understand everything, but his pursuit of knowledge really was with underlying an obsession with trying to grasp the uncomprehensible trying to understand what had happened to him. He didn't articulate that, he didn't identify that, but it's clear to me that his preoccupation, his obsession, was really about an effort to understand and a pursuit of peace. But I learned from my father's pursuit of knowledge which was to be fearless about pursuing knowledge. I suspect that one of the major reasons I took up drawing and painting in my 30s, because I wasn't daunted by the prospect of learning something new, because I had learned that from him as a model. In the show, I point out that my father died on the saddest day of the Jewish calendar, which is the day the Jews record the destruction of both temples temple destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, and the date the Romans destroyed the second temple, 70 BCE. The Romans destroyed the Hebrew temple, but they also had some good poets. One of them was Ovid. My father, who was really in exile from his own life throughout the years that I know him, was echoed for me in some lines that Ovid wrote. Ovid was also sent to by Augustus Caesar. The theory is he was sent into exile because he wrote a book endorsing adultery as an acceptable pastime. And Augustus Caesar frowned on it. So Ovid was exiled to a cold and dangerous place, which is in today is some part of Romania. Cut off from Roman life, he wrote many letters and poems complaining about his fate and hoping to be allowed to return. He never was, and he died there. But here are some lines that might have been spoken by my father as he sat in his retirement home that were written by him. I'm skeleton thin. I lack all taste for food. And the color that leaves have blanched at autumn's ending by the earliest frost of winter. That is the way my body looks now. Nothing cheers me. I'm depressed and listless. Querulous, always finding cause for complaint. I'm no sounder in mind than in body, a twin affliction, both equally sick. And always before my eyes, there sticks like a visible entity the shape, the presence of my ill fate, standing close for me to stand. And when I survey this place, its ways, speech, lifestyle, remembering who I am and what I was, so sharp is my death wish. I fault great Caesar's angers. Why could he not avenge his wrongs with the sword? But since he has once tempered his hatred, let him now lighten my exile by changing his venue. My father was a hard man to love. But in the last months of his life, he and I had a sort of communion. For most of his life, he rebuffed affection and insisted that pleasure was an impossible achievement. Gifts were ignored, birthdays were ignored. Nothing, in his view, should be celebrated. It's no accident that I write in the book that the dying on the saddest day of the Jewish calendar would have pleased him. But something happened to him in the last months of his life. He softened, may have been the drugs, may have been the illness, may have been the imminent death. And then he told me that he had a confession to make to me. He was not 
as we all thought, 92. After the war, the Zionists came to Europe looking for Jews to fight in the coming war with Palestine. And my father, living in the DP camp in Germany, thought the Zionists were more likely to take him if he was a younger man. So he took three years off his life. So in July of 2002, he confessed to me he wasn't really 92, he was 95. And the reason he made the confession is he wanted to gift me those extra three years. He wanted to gift me the knowledge that my genes were even better than I was. <laughs> so after he died, I had a great deal to reflect on. And the reflection took the form of these paintings and drawings. But I realized after I did the show that there was another reason I did it. For most of my life, I listened to my parents talk about the Holocaust. But the, the underlying theme of the story was one of anonymous brutality. My aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, they all died, but they were brutalized and died anonymously and in secret. In the book, there is a flyleaf that names the dead in my parents' immediate family. Uncles, aunts, half-siblings. I realized after I did the show that I didn't want my father to disappear as anonymous as those members of his family and my mother's family. I wanted his life in passing to be known. So that flyleaf page is the most important page for me.